I mean, it almost sounds like a game, right? I mean, at any time, any insurance co company can say, let's review some old applications and see where we can save money because we need to save money in the next couple of weeks. I mean, it, it seems very ad hoc, does it not? Well, it is. It, it, and, and the companies know that there are different places where they can go to to, to try to trim expenses, and that's one of them. Uh, it is ad hoc, but, there are, but they know where to go look and what to do. Fortunately, the legislation that, was, uh, that the president signed into law last March will outline Law, a lot of these practices. So, and to that uh, extent, this legislation is important because it will outlaw some of these egregious practices. Uh, whether it will keep them from engaging in them is another matter entirely because you need to have a very effective enforcement mechanism. Let me remind our audience we're speaking with Wendell Potter, former VP of Corporate Communications at Cigna. Uh, you know, it's funny, when we were going through the Barack Obama health care bill de debate, so to speak, the term death panels came out, right. and Sarah Palin and many others kind of repeated that. The closest thing to a death panel I've heard of since that time is this process that you're describing that took place, medical right. management, when insurance companies, or in this case Cigna, needed to save money. I mean, is, yeah. is that the closest thing to death panels you've seen? It's absolutely, it's, it's true. There, is, there was nothing in this legislation that would create a government death panel, absolutely not. But you are right in that um, what we have at this moment in time is uh, a system in which corporate bureaucrats, corporate executives can make the decision, life and death decisions, and they do that every every day. And these aren't doctors that are making these decisions, or, or are some of them doctors at it's, the insurance company? It, it, it's, it, it is uh, so, it, sometimes they're doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, at many of the companies, I get, in fact, uh, the ones that I work for, um, presumably only a doctor can make a decision to deny uh, a, an important procedure. Um, uh, but keep in mind, those doctors are corporate executives just as, just as I was. They know that they've got to do their part to uh, meet shareholders' expectations so they're not going to have their jobs for very much longer. So uh, they may have an MD after their, their names, uh, but they're as corporate as they, as they come. So there seems to be kind of this inherent conflict in that on one hand there's some who say, well, when we're dealing with people's lives and health, it shouldn't be combined with a profit motive. So therefore that would be an argument to take away health insurance or that mechanism from, from for-profit companies. At the same time, there's the, there's the argument that the government is inherently inefficient and the best motive for running it efficiently will be a private company. Where do you kind of see that inherent conflict? Well, I'm in the camp that we're in this predicament with having the most dis one of the most dysfunctional healthcare systems in the, in, on the planet and certainly the most expensive because we've allowed it to become controlled by big for-profit corporations and that is at the root of our problems here and that's why costs keep going up and up. We need to, that needs to happen to be able to meet the needs of Wall Street. Um, yeah, you can make arguments that the government is maybe not the most efficient uh, organization to uh, operate anything, but on the other hand, it, 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 the Medicare program is operated much more efficiently uh, and was with far less overhead, far fewer administrative costs than any privately run uh, insurance program in this country. Hmm. Um, in the last couple of minutes we have, I've kind of given up hope that we'll ever really see universal health care in the U.S. And I just think I'll just be much more comfortable if I just don't even think of it as a possibility. Just do the best I can with the system we have. And a lot of people come on the show and they say, that's not the way I should be thinking. It could happen. Um, should I just not think about it? Will I be much better off if I don't worry about it and just assume it's not going to happen? No, I'm going to have to spend some time with you to make sure that you understand <laughs> that you've got to hang in there and you've okay. got you to keep the faith because it can happen. Hmm. Um, and we need to think long term. And How long term, though? Well, I don't know. Um, it, it, you know, we've been trying to do this for 100 years. Uh, I hope it's not going to be that long. But if you look back in the course of this country, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was uh, uh, the first president to really bring up the idea of having universal coverage at a time when countries in Europe were beginning to do just that or, be, you know, going down the road to do that. Not a crazy liberal guy. Not, a, not at all. Not at all. And the, and the guys who uh, developed those programs in Europe were not necessarily crazy liberal guys either. Um, but, uh, in fact, I, I, I chronicle that in the book that I've written that will be coming out in this fall called Deadly Spin. But keep the faith because uh, we, need to th we need to think both short-term and long-term. We need to have a long-term strategy, and I emphasize the word strategy. We need to think strategically because that's how the 
for-profit companies do. They don't do anything without having a strategy. And uh, they, they, they operate quarter to quarter, so they certainly have uh, short-term interest. But they also uh, look a few years out, too. And that's what we need to do. We need to have a strategy for both short-term and long-term to get to where we need to be in this country. Is there any way that the companies like Cigna that you worked for, the pharmaceutical companies and the for-profit hospitals, all of whom undoubtedly have a lot of power and influence over the system, would allow universal health care to ever come, come into fruition in any way? Here's my dream. Uh, that uh, we, one way we, you know, there might, there might be many different ways that we can get to universal coverage and, and to get these companies out of control of our healthcare system. One is to make it not very profitable for these companies to operate in the healthcare industry. And that could happen. I've seen over the course of the 20 years I was in the insurance industry, these companies uh, sh changing their business models radically, uh, very radically. And there's no reason to think that that won't happen again in the next. 20 years. They change to meet the needs of shareholders. And as shareholders think that this is not the best place for them to get a good investment, a return on their investment, they'll take their money elsewhere and these companies will go with them. So it's possible that these companies, if we have very stringent regulation and if, uh, uh, if it's very effective and these companies may eventually uh, throw in the towel and say, let's let the nonprofits take care of it or let the government do it. Well, I hope you're right. We've been speaking with Wendell Potter, former VP of Corporate Communications at Cigna. Thanks so much. Thank you, David.